Hello, I'm Colleen Holder and this is Let's Talk Tobago. Today we're coming to you from the office of Chief Secretary Orville London, which is housed in the administrative complex in Calder Hall. This office is essentially one of 10 divisions within the structure of the Tobago House of Assembly. And as the name suggests, it's the headquarters of the Chief Secretary Orville London, who's also the leader of the Executive Council. We'll walk you through the halls and what we do here after we tell you what's happening in our stories this week. An app that helps Tima report to you as events unfold. Scandinavian travel agents get a taste of Tobago. The maiden flight from the region is mere months away. And a big event done with small island flair. Cyclists from around the world experience our rainforest. Yeah, you can be the greatest, you can be the best. You can be the King Kong banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. Talk the guy go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. Yeah. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Standing in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Sit Tobago, ready to provide your community with the highest degree of professional services in emergency response. Contact Sid Mariah at 660-0065 or Sid Speyside at 660-6096. Sid 24-hour services, emergencies, medical or other. Sid Pro, the new face of emergency management. Welcome back. You're viewing Let's Talk Tobago and we're here at the Calder Hall Administrative Complex which houses the Office of Chief Secretary Orville London. There are 14 units which fall under Mr. London's portfolio but only nine of them are located here. Among them, health and safety and human resources. Even the Office of the Chief Administrator is right here in this very building. But let's leave it there for now. We all know if information doesn't reach its intended target in a timely manner and it's also not precise, it's well pointless. And when that information is not random news but is needed to save lives and prevent catastrophes, it becomes even more critical to get it out there as events unfold. Well, this is now possible in Tobago. You can log on to a mobile app or a website to protect and prevent loss of life and limb in times of disaster. Davia Chambers tells us how. In a disaster, it's critical for the public to get real-time information, information that's accurate and disseminated quickly so that you can prepare. The answer? The Tobago Emergency Management Agency's Virtual Vision Platform, a unique multi-layered reporting tool which gathers relevant information from TEMA's database and distributes it. So for an example, like Mr. Padmo uses as an example, if there was, say, a landslide, and it happened over here, we were able to see an image that someone would have sent as it happened. Immediately, if you are dispatching emergency services, you will be able to reroute very, very quickly. The Virtual Vision platform operates in two systems, through live database and a mobile app. The aim is to achieve buying. So my friends at TSTT, Digicel, will be talking. Buying by the population, and more importantly, the citizens of the Bay. Both the public and VIPs can keep abreast of incidents as this reporting tool disaggregates information and disseminates it quickly through various media portals. This is all in an effort to assist in protecting human life and property. This is in keeping with our major part of our vision to embrace the dynamism of modern disaster management. Today, launch software will provide you, the end users, a real-time picture of emergency events by integrating modern products, such as smartphones, televisions, websites. The program will be available soon as Tima continues to focus on prevention, preparation, and mitigation against disasters. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. Their motto is to protect and serve with pride, but many argue that some in our police service hardly live up to this standard. Anecdotal evidence often portrays the police as uncaring and inefficient, 
but they're working on changing that image. They're getting into the communities and listening to residents. As Caroline Wallace tells us, it's the second meeting of its kind to take place. The first saw them interacting with the residents of Hope. Today, we share their Mount Pleasant visit. Police officers usually get a bad rap, but to change this, they are meeting with villagers to hear their concerns and suggestions to help in the crime fight on the island. Concerns like reducing the number of illegal firearms, the issue of officers having no transportation when you call a station, measures to address predial larceny were all belted out by the residents, who, in some instances, got immediate solutions to some of their complaints. Predial larceny, I realize, has been on the increase in the area. And to deal with it, we are trying to implement a specific unit of people to pay special attention to that particular type of crime. And on the issue of not being able to reach a police station in the wee hours of the morning, here are some options. If you communicate with the station directly and you don't get a response immediately, I want you to be mindful of where you live and the probability that the police officers may be engaged elsewhere. In that circumstance, dial 999. If that situation still exists, my telephone contact is 394-5288. The residents also wanted to know how effective a mobile unit will be. What we are engaging now is targeting patrols, where we target through a crime and problem and analysis unit. We get the data that the areas where the crimes are being committed, the days and the times, and focus the patrols in these areas to be more effective than establishing a mobile post, which would be something stationary. One of the suggestions coming out of the meeting was to have more foot patrols taking place. The police say this meeting is one way of ensuring that the community assists in the fight against crime. I am Caroline Wallace for Let's Talk Tobago. The end is near for visitors from the Scandinavian region who travel to Tobago. No more plane hopping or having to go through London or Germany to get here. They now have a direct flight to the capital of Paradise. Negotiations began last year, but the deal is now sealed. In fact, a group of Scandinavian travel agents came to see and experience firsthand what this island has to offer. We said, you know what, we will make it happen. The Tobago House of Assembly is committed. We're committed to the Scandinavian market. It is one of our prime markets. And it has happened. So much so that on December 3rd, around 7.45 p.m., the inaugural flight from Scandinavia to Tobago will be landing. But before this happens, the division wants to ensure that the travel agents from that region experience the destination firsthand. Pristine waters, our fascinating culture, and the warmth of our people. I think it's really important for us to be here since many of our customers is very curious about the destination. So they're asking us a lot of different questions questions which is more easy for us to to inform about and there's no story more convincing than the one you've experienced it's our mission to be here and explore the island we have been on a cruise today with the catamaran and see the west coast and it was really nice our first experience of tobago was perfect so great food and also fantastic nature. The flight is about 90% booked and hopes are that this trend will continue to increase the international arrivals as the flight will be journeying on a weekly basis. We felt that the partnership with Apollo was key to achieving this objective. Our objective, of course, is to expose our beautiful island as much as possible to all persons who are interested in coming and finding that fantastic vacation. Apollo Travel Agency gives passengers a direct flight to Tobago, an option that was not available since 2008. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago.
We're taking a break, but do stay with us because coming up, helping Tobagonians cope with Alzheimer's. You're viewing Let's Talk to Bego. Thanks for staying with us at the Calder Hall Administrative Complex and the Office of the Chief Secretary. Now, the operations at this building are not only on an administrative level, but it's also the home of the Department of Information, where this very program, along with many others, are produced for both radio and television. But let's take you away from here for a bit to share the work of a group that's been leaving the confines of their office and heading out into the housing developments they built for Tobagonians. It's a promise kept not only to provide adequate housing, but to ensure the place many call home is comfortable. Details from Crystal George. Secretary in the Division of Settlement and Labor, Huey Cudet, along with his team, journeyed to Plymouth area to query what problems the residents of Adventure Housing Development might be experiencing. They heard about cracks in houses, drainage issues, and the bushes being too high. And while it all sounds dire, that's exactly what the division wanted, to move away from a PR experience where the secretary simply shows his face and instead turn these visits into a listening exercise. The division intends to treat with these problems as priorities. It aims to begin work very soon, addressing the concerns raised by the residents. There's also another promise, the secretary says the Adventure Housing Development will be seeing more of him in the future. I'm Crystal George for Let's Talk Tobago. Do you or an older relative you know suffer from memory loss or have you noticed changes in their personality? If so, they may suffer from a form of dementia called Alzheimer's disease. What's more, there's an increase in the number of persons affected, forcing healthcare professionals to pay even more attention to the caregivers of these patients. Let's find out more from Omadara Mills. Around 38 million persons suffer from Alzheimer's disease, with 58% of those living in developing countries like Tobago, a number which will double by the year 2030. The disease is a progressive and fatal brain disorder. It damages brain cells, causing problems with memory, thinking, and behavior, severe enough to affect work, lifelong hobbies, or social life. And it's not only senior citizens who are affected. Alzheimer's is not part of a normal aging process. It's not part of it. It is a disease. So forgetting things and all that, that's not Alzheimer's. <laughs> all of us have it. And so you have to find out that the fact that someone is older, they're forgetting things, and it doesn't mean they have Alzheimer's. Although there isn't a cure at present, researchers are trying their best to develop methods which can detect the disease early, since a person may have the disease for years with some signs such as memory loss appearing only in the late stages of the illness. And one exciting thing is that one of the things, uh, the research that's going on into something called a biomarker for Alzheimer's is actually happening in Trinidad and Tobago. They're looking for a biomarker, and a biomarker is nothing more than being able to test for something in the blood. Dementia, a journey of caring, was the title of the workshop, and is not only focused on those with the disease, but also the caregivers. Caregivers also need to be looked after since their health is also jeopardized. We've got to seriously look at caregivers, because there's no support system for caregivers, and they need to be. Why? Because they're finding out that caregivers of people with Alzheimer's end up also getting failing health. 
The annual workshop has been supported by the Alzheimer's Association of Trinidad and Tobago, Seroptimist International Scarborough and the Division of Health and Social Services. All stakeholders have been given the task of beginning to collect data on the disease in Tobago in an effort to create policies which benefit both patients and the caregivers. I'm Umudara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. Staying with health for a while longer, we're turning our attention to Tobago's fight against a global epidemic. A report from the Joint United Nations Program for HIV-AIDS shows a 52% reduction in new HIV infections among children and a combined 33% reduction among adults and children since 2001. Here at home, there's been a decrease in stigma and discrimination. But as Davia Chambers tells us, more still needs to be done and one group has taken up that cause. They're working to ensure we get to zero. Zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination, zero AIDS-related deaths. Tobago has been continuously promoting awareness of the virus, but to achieve that target, the island has to move to another level. Awareness is where you are familiar with all the things that take place pertaining to the virus, right, and HIV. What we want to do is to step up the ladder. We want you to be able to reach out to every single member of your family, every single member of your work colleagues, every single member of your neighborhood to, you know, enforce safe sex practices. She says a behavioral change is also needed immediately. We no longer want to have the, as the local palance would say, the skin to skin, right? Because you know there are effects that result from the skin to skin. The group is urging Tobagonians to take responsibility for their health and relationships. Average age of infection on this island is as young as 14 years and up. FOTUS provides education and support to persons living with HIV and AIDS on the island. The walk was part of its activities for AIDS Awareness Week. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. It's time to take another break, but on the other side, world-class cyclists take a competitive ride through Tobago's rainforest. This is Let's Talk to Beagle. Thanks for staying with us at the office of Chief Secretary Orville London at Calder Hall. This is what the building looks like on an average day, but it can be transformed into a hotbed of activities for various events hosted by the Chief Secretary, from Easter to Christmas and even an aerobics burnout. Bet you never thought of that. But as you ponder this, here's a big event done small island style which showcases Tobago to the world. This year, 22 regional and international teams from over 25 countries participated, something the organizers say is unprecedented anywhere in this region. It's the annual Tour of Tobago, and it's another opportunity to showcase this island as an appealing global brand and destination. They ride all over the world, including Tobago. But this year, they'll be riding in a spectacular place, through our rainforest. This is so as there's a newbie event in the 27th edition of the Tobago Cycling International Classic, Mountain Biking. I thought of doing the mountain biking two or three years ago and I made a decision to try and put it in place this year because we're trying, as I said, to broaden the reach of the sporting fraternity and to attract more visitors to Tobago. Mountain biking has become very popular worldwide and in Trinidad Tobago now. So we thought it might be a good idea to, to extend it to the mountain bikers. Of course, 
also for them to get a chance to go through the rainforest of Tobago, which we, we all know that is so beautiful. While having international countries participate is awesome, developing our riders to compete on this level is also important, and 10 Tobagonian riders are taking up the challenge. They've started a local club and, um, you know, it, it, it's really good for cycling because um, for a few years, you know, apart from myself, the, you know, cycling was um, non-existent, you know, and uh, it's really good to see that we have a little club going and, you know, they've really started, you know, trying to um, promote the, the, the cycling fraternity again here in Tobago. Mr. Charles adds that this year there are also some new countries participating as they try to place more emphasis on creating Tobago as a sports tourism destination. This year we have like Denmark, first time Denmark as a country will be taking part. Um, we have Guadeloupe. And the participants are geared up and in competition mode. It's my first time I do this race. Last year I were here and did the tour of Trinidad and Tobago. So I know the island pretty well. Uh, I expect to you be in top 10 in the GC. It's, it's great to come home and race on home soil and uh, you know this store has become a really huge factor in the world of cycling and uh, it's really good to see that um, we have such an event here in Tobago and um, you know my form and my fitness is really good and I'm hoping to you know put a good performance here. Well you'll have to wait to hear if those expectations were met. After the riders would have finished the Shirvan Canby Circuit, Blackrock Lakoto, Plymouth and the Scarborough Criterium. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. You use it every day when you talk, play music, paint or even use any form of energy. You might not know it or make an immediate association, but science is involved in a great part of our lives. It's also an aspect of the school's curriculum that was chosen to be on display, more like center stage at the annual Science Exposition in Tobago. Omadara Mills reports. Whether it's finding a way to purify dirty pond water, making paint out of homemade materials, or understanding that music is one example of sequencing, hundreds of students engaged in practical science at this year's science fair under the theme, Science is Creativity art, entertainment, energy, and innovation. A student of Bonacord Government Primary School, Leroy Noel, is a budding engineer and a mathematician. This is his second time at the fair, and he's very excited about his marble run creations. There's physics itself, velocity and acceleration, potential and kinetic energy, gravitational force, slope, and engineering. Science and the technology help people to live better lives, and this fair shows the possibilities and the hows. It helps in alleviating some of the problems that we might have, just like with the filtration system. It also helps in terms of making life easier, and I found that when the students get involved in technology, they are more excited and willing to learn, so science is good for them in that way. For the exposition, the teachers and the students of the Lands for Me Methodist Primary School are looking at generating alternative forms of energy such as wind, solar, water and biomass for their village. As you know, Lands is a very remote area, so we are trying to sensitize our students as to how they can um, visualize or see science in their everyday lives, you know, and what kind of contributions they can make towards the environment through science. The Science Fair, which is facilitated by the Division of Education, Youth Affairs and Sport, runs for one week. It's done in the form of a competition where groups, teachers and students compete for various prizes for their displays, presentations and innovations. I'm Umidara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. The trophy has been won by the East. It's changed hands and gone to the West thanks to the Family First Foundation. And this year it will remain there but with Signal Hill. They're the winners of this year's edition of the Heritage Food Fair competition. Time to gain some insights into their winning recipes and unique offerings. Smoked stew chicken. Stew pork. Sounds good? Tastes even better. Prepared the old time way by the Signal Hill Village Council who walked away with the first place prize. But what was different in their preparation? They included sweets. We were trying to bring back the, the foods that we ate long time, like the guava and the, the gugu 
and Guinea Tambra and those things that the young people don't know anything about. So that was part of it, to bring back the fruits that we ate long time and the food that we ate long time. The 12 participants were judged on taste, creativity, display, punctuality and attire. Miss Sober says the key for them was following tradition. Just basically the same way that our four parents would have prepared the food, we just try to use more local seasoning and the roku, especially the roku. Most people would have used curry, but we use the roku to really bring out the flavor in the food. The coordinator of the program, Ayana Webster Roy, says it's all about seeking greater appreciation for our indigenous cuisine. What we um, encourage communities to do is to showcase what makes your um, cuisine unique, what makes the blue food in Bloody Bay different to the blue food in Roxborough, what makes a uh, fish broth in Charlottesville different to a fish broth maybe in Buku. And that's what we want to try and encourage. And while next year's competition is far away, things are already heating up in these villagers' kitchens. I want to tell my competitors that next year, Signal Hill is there to lift this trophy again because we have started preparing for next year Heritage Festival. But Signal Hill, we'll be coming to you next year. And from the first, from the first we have lent you all last year. So we are coming next year. Second place went to Pembroke Village Council and Lakoto Village Council grabbed the third spot. The Heritage Food Fair has been going on for 20 years, but the competitive aspect of it started in 2010. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. And it's time to have your say, the segment of our program where we hear from you, our viewers. As you may know, the Tobago House of Assembly, the THA, was forced to return to the drawing board after the national budget was read. The scenario they faced left them with very little money to do any of the projects they had set out to accomplish. The Chief Secretary has since assured Tobagonians that this island will not suffer because the Assembly has been starved of funds. So today we're asking, what should be given priority as the THA reallocates its funds? This is what you said. Agriculture, this is mostly boost agriculture in Tobago in general because Right about now, to import things coming in and farmers here could, um, could plant things here and we could benefit from it. Well, I think they should focus most importantly on fixing the roads in, an, in, in the Scarborough area and out of Scarborough area because when you go outside of the area of Scarborough, the roads are in a bad condition. When the oil and gas done, our grandchildren have to return to agriculture. So they should put more emphasis on agriculture. And that's how we bring this week's edition of Let's Talk Tobago to a close. Do remember you can send us your comments to information at tha.gov.tt or visit us at www.tha.gov.tt. Like us on Facebook and add us to your YouTube playlist. I'm Pauline Holland. On behalf of all of us at the Department of Information, have a safe and enjoyable week.